start in, oh, I pressed it. Uh, it's, it's started. Hello, everybody. Welcome to um, the Open Life Science 11th uh, week. This is cohort call seven, I think, something like that. Um, and we are over two thirds of the way through the program at the minute. So today we have two topics that we're going to be talking about. One is Open Science Career Paths. We have three fantastic speakers who are all here with us. And the other thing we will be talking about is uh, ally skills and self-care. So I like to see this as a progression. First of all, we talk about um, all of the things that we might be doing. Then we talk about taking care of ourselves uh, while we're doing these things. And then we talk about taking care of others as allies. Um, so a reminder, we have a code of conduct uh, and community participation guidelines. Generally, this means be nice to one another and treat each other with res the same respect that you would like to be treated with. Um, there is more to it than that, so please click through and have a read. Um, if at any point you witness or experience anything that you believe isn't in line with our code of conduct, then you can report it to a team at openlifeside.org. The reporting information is on the top of the third page at the moment. Um, or if it is someone individual who has um, caused this, who is one of the Open Life Science founders, then you can always email myself or Malvika or Berenice directly so that you can circumvent speaking to one of the people who was a problem. Um, so with that over um, and a fantastic set of icebreaker questions, I think Malvika was going to introduce our Open Science career paths. Malvika, over to you. Um, I will start with the with the similar sort of story that we talked about when we started this program, that when we are doing open science, often we don't know what is the right way to do it. We might have learned some of the skills on the way, but we don't really know how to apply them step by step. And we have tried to do that in the last uh, 11 weeks. And it's really amazing that you all have been so involved and we have seen your progress. And we've also learned through on the way. The three speakers that we have today with us are some of the greatest open scientists in our network. And we are super, super delighted to have them here. Our first speaker is uh, Fotis. Um, then Beth Duckles will uh, talk about the open post-academic program that she is a part of and how she is leading her uh, community. And then we have Jason Williams, who is uh, just a blast in open science community. So I will start with Fotis. Uh, I'll let you introduce yourself and uh, go ahead with your talk. All right. Um, hi, everyone. So um, I've already put some slides um, on the search Google Docs, so feel free to go through them directly. Um, I'll try to go through them at the same time. Uh, but as a short introduction, um, so my name is Fadis uh, Olopoulos. I am a PI at the Institute of Applied Biosciences in Thessaloniki, in Greece. Um, actually, um, if you go to the second slide, you'll be able to see exactly where this is located for those who have no idea where Thessaloniki is, is which is not very unusual. Sorry, what? Would you like me to share the screen for you? Oh, yeah, that, that, yeah. You can tell that, me when to go next. Excellent, yeah, we can do that. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, sounds, sounds nice. Right, so as I was saying, um, the topic of what I was trying to talk about is Basically, I was asked to talk about leadership in, in academia. And I'll start by saying that I, I think I have no idea what I'm talking about. So um, let's, let's start with that um, level of, of uh, expectation so far. So this is sort of an introduction uh, from my side. <clears throat> so the one in the middle is the Institute of Applied Biosciences, where I'm actually located. Um, I'm involved in um, three things that I think may be relevant to what we're going to discuss. The one is um, I'm doing a lot of training, especially um, in the countries and Elixir. I'm part of the Elixir community and in that community uh, I'm part of the Leadership for the Training platform. Uh, I also have a lovely family of, um, with two kids, um, 
who are actually fighting indoors right now. And I'm also an avid gamer when I find the time, which is something that I can literally do uh, right now. So uh, if you can press next, please. So this is where Thessaloniki is, is located. This is where my institute is located. And if you click again, this is where Greece is, and this is where actually Thessaloniki is located. One more. And this is where the whole thing is in the world. So just to put things in perspective, this is where I am right now. So next one, please. Um, when we are talking about leadership, is my understanding was is always that people have the perception that other people know what they are doing, and I'm fairly convinced right now that no one is actually know, know knows what they're doing, um, and they appear they have this um, this um, this knowledge, this um, skill, if you like. So what I try to do in the next few slides is basically um what i think leadership is is and i try to use as much of a context as possible especially given my own personal experience as a, as a pi and a very decent pi to be honest in that next one please so this is the definition uh we can really go over that really fast because the definition is something that i like to have as a context but it's not something meaningful eventually if you go down to it so application of knowledge experience skills whatever it's basically turn ideas into action. And this is a very specific definition that comes from project leadership, which in my mind is a bit different from what we're, when we're talking about leadership in, in that context. Next one, please. So these are some quotes I really like and I try to, to keep in mind. So the one is from J.F. Kennedy, leadership and learning are dispensable with each other. So you always need to learn if you want to be able to lead. And while you're leading, you're also learning at the same time. So they are very well connected to each other. Uh, the second point, again, from Roosevelt is um, that the leader leads and the boss drives, which is something that is painfully evident in some groups when the leader, instead of actually showing how things should be doing, has all the expectations and nothing to, to, to go for than that. And the final point is that leadership eventually seems to be something that you achieve more than is like by definition possible. And this is by empowering other people to work with you instead of working under you or whatever the context of the hierarchy is in that place. So next one, please. So these are some soft skills I sort of believe make sense in terms of leadership and in terms of effective leadership. So good communication is one of the key ones for me. Uh, make sure that when you're talking to someone else, you're actually clear enough to know what you're talking about. Um, be flexible enough so when it's not clear what the what the what the other person might mean, you can sort of understand and sort of go with the flow. Um, work well enough with the team, so this is sort of um, probably self-evident. Be motivated enough, which is a key point in my mind, because if you're not motivated to actually lead someone else, uh, this someone else is not going to be interested in in in, in your effort in the first place. Stress management is something that is even more prevalent in these days, because as a group leader, you're not only expected to sort of help work move forward, but actually make sure that people working with you are not very stressed, which is probably impossible right now. And the final one is to make sure that um, whatever team you have is actually a team and not a set of individuals working everyone to, to their own and actually have a team in that place. Uh, next one, please. So these are the, the three like keywords in my mind when you're talking about leadership. So the one is the accountability. I've also put some notes in the, um, in the slides if you want to go through them later. Uh, so accountability, and I put the Greek word uh, on the top um, right, Athene, for those who want to know how this is pronounced, is make sure that when you are taking action, you know who is responsible for it and you can explain what the actions are. And a counter argument to that is do not make someone accountable for something that they cannot control. So if you are assigning blame or assigning duties to someone, make sure that this is something that is under their control. Otherwise, you cannot hold them accountable for that. Um, authority is basically the uh, connection to um, the definition is to have the power to do something. But in terms of leadership, my mind authority is the concept of 
taking the lead and moving forward ahead with projects. So for example, in the context of the upcoming Bio Hackathon, there is a lot of work being, being done, a lot of discussion being had, but if you want to be able to lead, you have to self-empower to take the initiative and start moving towards the topic. And people generally tend to follow that. Um, and the autonomy is basically the desire to um, moving forward and ideally without the direct supervision. But basically the autonomy is something that you gain along the way, especially in an academic environment. Um, I was fortunate enough in my previous, my PhD, um, as a PhD student and later as a postdoc to have um, advisors and supervisors that way they give, gave me enough autonomy to work projects that I liked in addition to the work that they expect from me. And this helped me a lot in, in drawing. And this is something that I try to, to do in, in, in any case, in my own group at least. Um, next one, please. So how to make sure that you can cultivate those attributes? Because as a skill, it's something that you can sort of cultivate. So this is a long list, and I'm not going to go into each and every one because I'm, I don't want to spend all the time talking about that. There are much more interesting things after this introduction. Um, but there are like four more, four key points. The one is the curiosity. Um, so the leaders are learners. When you want to uh, be able to lead on something, you actually want to be interested enough and curious about it so that you can move forward with that. Um, the integrity is knowing yourself, what are your weaknesses, and essentially make sure that when you promise something, you try your best to follow up with that and sort of be a role model, if that makes sense. Um, and the final point that I want to highlight is the last bullet point. So it's the listening, because uh, as, a list, as, a, as a leader, as a group leader, or as leader in whatever project, you need to be aware to be able to listen to your team. And this is a key point because not everyone is, can be really open and everyone has a different way of communicating information back to, to, to whoever is supervising. So being able and putting the effort to listen exactly to what your people are trying to, to talk about is, um, is, is a key point. Uh, next one, please. Um, the last slide, and I'm going to shut up then and give the floor to, to anyone else after that, um, is um, the delegation. So a lot of, um, I've been in a lot of groups that um, try to micromanage. So basically hover above someone else working and try to say, now you do that, now you do that, now you do that. And although it might work in very early stages of, of academia, at the same time, it, it, it shows that you don't have enough confidence in your own skills and you want to sort of force your own approach into whatever they're trying to do. Um, and at the same time, you, because you don't empower them, they don't get the initiative to actually move forward and do more stuff for their own. Um, so this is like a, an interesting point that I, I try to keep in mind. Uh, and final slide and um, is essentially when you want to provide feedback. And this is something that I try to take from the handbook of the countries. When you want to provide feedback, try to be as explicit as possible, always in a positive context. But I also have this approach when, when you want to offer criticism, it try to, to make sense to have it at a private context. So not have a person come into the spotlight. But when you offer praise, this is something that you should always do in a wide honor. So you can clearly say that this is a good thing. Let's celebrate that. Um, and with that, um, so there, I, oh, I forgot to hide the next three slides. So please skip like three times. These are general suggestions. I put them slides because it's, it's something that people might be interested in. Um, so one more. Uh, there we go. So <laughs> it was a very, very, very short intro to what I think is, a, is, is leadership in academia and what I believe are the key points in that. But um, in my mind, talking about leadership is not necessarily having someone like me talking about slides, but actually if you have any particular questions that I can sort of offer some ideas, I would be more than happy to have the discussion, either here or over Twitter or over any other means that you consider appropriate and you're fine with. 
thank you thank you so much for this um do we have some questions for Portis? Dumbfounded with everyone. Can I ask you on behalf of them, <laughs> um, how has it been to transit from being a postdoc per se to a group leader who, where you have postdocs to manage? Was the how difficult was this transition, and what would be the advice you would give? All right, that's an excellent question. Um, I will first of all refer you to slide three. I have no idea what was happening at any given point. So it was. I think it was always the difficult you, the same essentially difficult from going from one role to another. So for going from an undergraduate to a PhD student, to a grad student, it was, it had some difficulty because you had to adjust. Essentially the first years, probably teaching people who were actually your colleagues a few years back. Um, same from a PhD to a postdoc. So it, it's, it is definitely a feeling that you have encountered. So in terms of difficulties, the extra one is, I think, time management. So it's something that you have to get some I don't know if it's training or experience or anything else for that matter, or, or a, a personal drive, um, because time actually comes a very limited factor after a while. So that is my, my key difficulty that I carried from moving as a postdoc to, um, to a group leader. But another point is that I feel that I was very privileged in my last postdoc advisor and my PhD advisor because both of them, um, either they were very busy, so they didn't bother with me, but I will try to interpret in a different way in the sense that they really gave me the opportunity to, um, to take initiative and, and pursue projects I was interested in. So I had to try to balance my time in the first place and have the opportunity to fail early enough um, in projects that didn't work out or collaborations that I tried to have and didn't work out. So that would be my take on that. I don't know if it's useful or not. That's super useful, especially the last part that you said, uh, taking leadership early on so you have time to experiment. Uh, we have a hand from uh, Holger. Yeah, I have a question to Fotis. Um, regarding micromanagement, how do you avoid falling into the trap of micromanaging at the one time? I mean, you need to balance things, but how do you, how do you do that? How do you avoid micromanaging at the same time as, uh, I mean, things need to get done, right? You're How absolutely do... right. And I have two answers to that. So the first answer is that, again, he relying heavily um, on the book of the countries, when I try to give advice on a particular task, I have my hands behind my back, which means I try actively to think I'm not going to intervene what they're trying to do. Um, so that's something that you have to sort of get the skill. At the same time, as you said, there are time constraints in actually to have a project move forward. So for that, I try to communicate exactly the tasks that need to be done. And in the early stages, when I start a collaboration with a student, for example, for their, for their thesis or for a new project, I try to have a sort of weekly touch base thing, a very informal one, but one that sort of gives the opportunity to only learn what they did last week, essentially. So I'm not going to, I'm not asking them to let me, to tell me, this is what I'm doing now, this is my process, this is what I'm going to do. But essentially, in broad terms, this, this week I tried to play around with library X and I tried this experiment, that's it. It's fine for me because then I understand what they have and if they have a problem, if I see they go in the path that, in my understanding, might lead to a dead end and then cause problems in, in the time scale, in the time frame of the project, I have a follow-up discussion on Monday usually because I expect this sort of a note by Friday. So on Monday, I have a discussion in the sense, can you let me know what is your approach? What are the next steps you're going to, 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 to happen, to, to take towards it? 
the upside is that in most cases, when, I, when you listen to what other people might say, even if it does not seem a very correct approach, you might come up with a novel thought, a novel idea that you haven't come up with in the first, in, in, by, by yourself in the first place. So it might have something to gain by going down an approach you haven't thought of. At the same time, I have to admit that I have at least two cases where this didn't work as good as, as I originally planned. And I had to really step in and put work that I, time that I didn't have to help really do some work to achieve a particular goal. This is something that you, you risk, but at the same time, you have to manage these expected risks. And yeah, I don't know if this makes sense or it might mumble a lot. Um, have I answered your question, Holger? Okay. I like the hand. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fotis. Fotis has left his email and contact details. Uh, please reach out to him if you need to. So um, we'll do we have time? time for There's the one question in the document I don't think we noticed. No, I'm sorry. Please go ahead. Uh, so someone asks, what to do if you feel unhappy about the existing leadership of lead versus drive? I notice about myself that I easily become unhappy, but then I slide into aggressive childish mode instead of changing the situation for better. All right. This is an excellent question. And again, I can try to, to talk from, from personal experience. Um, I, I have the experience of being in a group where um, I could have a better, um, better guidance or better over, over supervising. Um, I did try a lot to sort of communicate that, but eventually the solution I got for myself was to, to leave the group, which was not an easy decision uh, because it had very different and various repercussions later on, both professionally and personally. But at the same time, it's much, I feel it was the right choice, even in hindsight, because if you can, if you try to communicate this to the best of your ability, because as a, if you have a leader, a, whatever, in whatever calling, it might be even a poster that is overseeing your, um, your, your PhD thesis or your um, diploma thesis, or it could be the director of a whole um, university. In both cases, if there is no clear line of communication, you can try various ways from arranging meetings with particular topics, setting an agenda before about <clears throat> things that you like to, would like to improve, but don't work for you at this time. I did also try to offer suggestions on how this can be addressed or how it can be sort of solved to my, um, to my uh, perspective. Uh, but if now none of those things work, then my, my honest suggestion would be try to, to move on. I know it's, it's not an easy decision always, but um, I think it, it, it is much more important to have a healthy personal and professional life. Well, no, professional life. The personal life probably connects, but I'm talking about the professional life, um, than sort of sticking to a group that is perhaps more very prestigious or in a high end or very uh, high level, um, highly ranked institution uh, than staying there. I know it might make sense. Or, or if I have answered um, the question. Thank you once again. Um, let's move on to Beth. Hello, thank you so much to um, everyone for uh, inviting me in. I do have a slide, um, there's a link to it. Would, would you be willing to share it, Malvika? Great. Um, so thank you so much for bringing me here. Um, I have a tendency to talk fast. Feel free to set, set a note if I am talking too quickly. Um, my name is Beth. I run the Open Post Academics Group, um, which is another one of the Mozilla um, Open Leaders groups. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about my past, but I'll give you a little bit of a background. I'm a social scientist. I'm a sociologist. I taught for a number of years at a university and realized that it wasn't for me. Um, in that time, I also spent a year at the AAAS with the American Association for the Advancement of Science and spent a year working at the Department of Energy. So I got to know science policy a little bit and connections to science. And these days, once I, I decided to leave my position, I now do um, 
basically research consulting. I, I like to joke that I teach scientists how to do human-centered data, you work with social data. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the things that I've learned as someone who's been running an open program for um, postdocs. I've been doing it for quite a while. This is um, I've, I've got an online community for women and gender uh, non-conforming folks to, to talk about leaving academia. And then I've also opened up this open path post tax. So what I want to talk about is, you know, you, 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 you have positions here in academic uh, situations now. Why might you want to think about this? And I think I'm not going to belabor this, but I think you know that the world is changing. We've got COVID, uh, which is changing the landscape for most of, of uh, everything. But also the market hasn't been doing very well in most fields uh, for a while. Um, so that may be different where you're at, but I think it's really not a bad skill to start to think about how to open yourself up and your, your thinking to doing work outside of the um, academy. Can we go to the next slide, please? So these are the three challenges I typically see. Um, and this comes from having talked to folks, done research, um, these are the things people tell me. They don't like networking or using social media. They have challenges with that. They, they struggle with it. They have uncertainty about how to translate their academic skills. They don't know how to make the, the leap between the work that they do now and the work they want to, might want to do somewhere else. And they have a sense of paralysis about what they might want to do next. Um, I, I should also say I'm a social scientist and most of what I do is, is, is talking with social science and humanities folks, but this I think is quite applicable to STEM folks as well. I do still keep in contact with a lot of the folks from my AAAS and they're actually quite a number of the mentors for my, my uh, group. So I don't think these challenges are uh, just in those areas, but I will probably be talking mostly from those areas. We can go to the next one. So this is what I hear when people talk about social uh, about networking. I don't. I know I'm supposed to talk to, to new people. I don't want to. I don't like to ask people to do things if I can't do anything for them. I'm an introvert. I don't like either LinkedIn or some, Twitter or whatever else. Ethical issues, worries about harassment. All of these are legitimate. We can go to the next slide. But I'm a social scientist and I can tell you networks matter. <laughs> so this is the Grand Vetter piece about finding, it's a, it's a well-known piece about finding a job. You need these weak ties to be able to have connection to get a job or to get work that you might want to do. And I would encourage you as an antidote to this to consider making the networks that you want to make. Find the people you find interesting and that are, that are compelling to you. Use your chance networking and your time doing uh, interaction to do things that are that seem fun to you. So if you'll go to the next one, here are some ideas for how you might do that. Talking to people who might interest you, and you've got some phenomenal people already in this this group. Uh, so I'm sure you're talking to interesting people here. But you know, connecting to folks, doing uh, you know, looking at folks on social media that you like. I love the idea of writing a review of something that you admire because I think that can be a really powerful way to share new information with people that you're interested in, but also feel like you're adding some, but something. Um, answering questions, organizing meetups, creating open resources, that kind of thing. Um, I think these things and openness in general is a really great way to get to talk to and network with people. Next one, please. I hear a lot about translating academic skills, especially from folks who've been doing um, their work for a long time. They often have a lot of jargon or technical terms that they're used to using that may or may not be understood outside of the academy. Um, so I've, and I'll just give you a quick uh, story about this. I once was helping somebody who, uh, with, with her resume, and she had listed a whole bunch of stuff on her resume, and I said, but I know you, and I know you speak four languages. Why is this not on your resume? And she said, well, I didn't think it was a skill. <laughs> I was like, this is, this is, you know, this is a skill, right? And I realize you may not want work doing translation, for instance, or, or other things. But sometimes we think, I think academics can overlook the skills that we actually have. Um, and things like leadership through, we heard our, our last speaker talk about leadership. We have developed maybe some leadership skills. We've taught classes. We, we are comfortable often with speaking in public environments. Those kinds of things we can typically just gloss over because they're not particularly valued um, as exceptional in the academy. They're, valued outside. So um, if you'll go to the next slide. So these are just a list of them. We talked about it in my open group. There's more out there. Look for lists of things that people typically who are academics have. 
Uh, this is my list here. So technical writing, editing, leadership, public speaking, information synthesis, uh, just the skill of being able to read a lot of information and pull it down into something smaller is a huge skill um, in, the, in the public world. Um, so knowing what those skills are, you may have to change the language of the things that you've done before, but figuring out how to do that is, is possible. So my antidote to this, the next slide please, um, is to get curious. Um, what could I do? How could I make these things, this transition? Uh, informational interviews are a fantastic place to figure this out. Talking to somebody in a new industry and saying, this is the skill I have, how might you use that? Is there something that you, that you think I, I might be able to do in this area? I also think you cannot neglect the fundamentals of your field. Um, I just really am grateful for science communication right now <laughs> in this time of COVID. I want more people to explain this to me in language I can understand and use. Um, so please do that, right? Um, I'm, I'm smart, but I don't know enough about this to really understand the field of epidemiology. And I rely on people who can communicate that to be able to understand it. I also think, and this is one of the key things I think in the field of open, is help people solve problems. Find out what the problems are and offer something as a solution. Even if it's not the full solution, something that they can use is, is helpful. And if the problem is interesting to you, then it's gonna be really beneficial for other people. Okay, the next one. Uh, I hear a lot of paralysis, um, and I think this is because a lot of us academics can really be in our head a lot. We spend a lot of time thinking um, I don't know what I want to do. I could do this. I could do that. I could do this other thing. Which one? Um, I need money. Um, if you've maybe been on the market or you just lost your adjunct position or whatever, uh, I don't know what to do next. And I will say just uh, with a lot of empathy, COVID is increasing this paralysis. It's not going to go down. We're going to get more of it. My response to this is um, develop an attitude of imperfect action over inaction. Um, one question that's been really helpful to me is to look at what inaction has cost me um, because I, I think sometimes I don't always think about inaction as being, I think of it as just being, well, I'll just put off the decision, but there's, there's a kind of question mark there that can be helpful. And then consider the smallest imperfect action and to try to take that action, which is again, very hard to do, but if you have community, it can be helpful to say, hey, I'm taking this imperfect action, could you support me in it? Um, here are some small actions I can think of, um, asking for advice, answering questions on social media, researching directions, writing a really crappy draft. I also, the last uh, mark here is just something that I think I really like to encourage academics to do, is that I think sometimes we can over perfect things that we have already. Um, and that some of our, our kind of you know, notes or the things that we did when we were doing a project can be really helpful for other folks. And if we're willing to share them, it's possible to put out stuff that's maybe not perfect, but that could potentially help somebody in the future. So um, if you can put out some of your half-baked ideas and even say they're half-baked, I think it can be beneficial to other people to see that that stuff is in the world. Um, so that's my third antidote. This is a uh, really quick, um, I gave you just a quick flyby, but I wanted to give you sort of the basics of, of what I think about, about open, about leaving academia and what kind of the challenges are with that. There's a lot more in the book. You can see the uh, book.openpostdoc.org. Those are all the notes from our eight weeks of talking to each other. We're also gonna be doing a um, money and postdoc uh, workshop coming up in, on April 9th. I didn't put this down in the notes, but I can do it. And you're welcome to sign up for that if you're at all interested. Um, that will also, the, the notes from that should be in the, in the book once we get them done. But I would love to answer questions and um, thanks for having me here. It was really fun to get to talk to you all. Thank you so much, Beth. Mm -hmm. Let me go to the document and see if we have question written down. Um, do we wanna ask some questions to Beth? <laughs> Can I ask a question? Um, so often post-academic pathways are very entrepreneurial mm -hmm. and uh, there's a huge problem of finding fund. Mm -hmm. Can you help us understand the pathway better? Yeah, I mean, I think um, 
the way we're approaching it with this workshop that we're doing is that a lot of the mindsets around money that come from the academic environment um, are um, not helpful as you're trying to be an entrepreneur in the in the in the sort of wider world i think um, and i should say that that you know sometimes people leave the academy but are still working on grant funds or there's you know there's there's ways that are um, different but i think it's it's worth kind of thinking through how you can value your own skills and value your approaches to problem solving in different ways um, I've been sometimes surprised by the uh, the things I can do that are, you know, I would consider them bespoke, but also very uh, simple, not simple, but like no, re relatively like um, basic level social science that I sometimes do for folks um, that I can charge a lot more for outside of the academy. And part of the reason for that is that I'm doing more work to help them understand and interpret the results that I'm giving them. And that kind of thing, you know, it's it, I, I have to value myself and my skills a little bit differently. Instead of thinking about the teaching as something that I would just do because I love doing it, the teaching is actually integrated into the consulting products that I do. So it's thinking a little bit differently about the value that you offer and how to charge for that value um, in an entrepreneurial sense. Um, I do think that, have, go ahead. Do you have like a reference or tips on how people can put a value on their skills when they are offering outside? Yeah, I think what you have to do is, or what I've been doing anyway, is going to a lot of, um, of business consulting folks. There's a, there's a really great set of marketing. Um, I, I'll, I'll think of Seth Godin, Jonathan Stark, um, I can put some of the links in there. These are folks that you might not look at if you were worried about them being too businessy. You sort of have to look past the front cover of them and then find the parts of them that are useful for your own um, needs. Uh, I, I, I take, I read business books um, and I take what I, what I want and I leave the rest. So being willing to be critical about them if you need to be, but also being willing to read what they have to say because often they have more experience in business than you do. So I can put some of the lists down there if you'd like. Thank you so much, Beth. Mm -hmm. uh, sure. Beth has also left us her social media account and the email. Please contact if in need. So we're gonna move on to Jason. Okay, can everybody hear me? I guess since uh, Zoom transitioned me to the center here and just putting on a timer. I am now making more slides than I ever have on a weekly basis in my life, so I'm not making slides for this uh, to spare you uh, that. Okay, uh, so if I, I first of all thank you uh, to Yo and Alvika and others for the invitation. Very happy to have a chance to speak and also lucky to go after Fotis and Beth so I could hear their wonderful stories and presentations and also uh, then try to avoid anything uh, that they've already sort of covered. Um, if I were to give any advice regarding uh, career paths, uh, and then I'll tell you about myself in a little bit, I guess. Uh, I guess I would try to s summarize it in uh, three phrases. Uh, create the opportunities that you're looking for, take the opportunities that you are given, and also really work to understand people. So creating opportunities, taking opportunities, understanding people. If I could give anybody career advice, those would be the three things I would tell them. So let me try to backfill. So I am at uh, Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory in New York. I don't have a wonderful map, but actually probably, I guess if you're watching the COVID news, you know where New York is by now, if you haven't known it for other reasons. Uh, we are on Long Island, which is about 30 miles uh, east of the city. I was born in the city, but I'm, I, I live and work out on Long Island at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, uh, which is among, among other things, the home of American eugenics, has a wonderful, <laughs> interesting history. <laughs> but I have to like pull out things that will make you like, what, what did he say? Well, yes, uh, but that's uh, most that we're known for. It's really a fantastic place to work. I've been there for about 15 years. Um, and in the biological sciences, <clears throat> which since this is the open life science group, uh, except for this year, uh, we typically see about eight to 10,000 visitors uh, 
scientists uh, from all over the world who come through. So it really is at a focal point in the sciences and the biological sciences that there's really a number of fantastic colleagues that I'm privileged to have the opportunity to work with. So there's always uh, somebody amazing uh, coming through, passing through, or happening to stay a little while. And um, I, you know, everything in my life, I would say, it was un is fairly unplanned. Uh, and uh, some people might have had a lot of drive, and I need to do this, and I must be this by this age, and that by that age. And more my style was kind of like, I'll just kind of float along and whatever, uh, wherever I seem to stick for a little while, that'll, that'll work for me. And so I started um, in Cold Spring Harbor after leaving Stony Brook, which is actually a little bit further out on the island in 2004, working in the plant group as a technician, thinking about what I was going to do. And then um, took some various little paths along the way, all at, at Cold Spring Harbor. So actually, the, the joke is that I, I travel a lot. And so I'm often somewhere else, usually uh, more than I am at, at uh, my home institution, teaching and um, doing all sorts of workshops and things like that. But uh, I am currently an assistant director at the Learning Center, uh, which is uh, lots of hands-on molecular biology as well as bioinformatics. And so since we have basically taken every single thing we've done online, um, I am teaching things online and all of helping my colleagues to be able to transition that way. Um, so back to the pieces of advice. Um, the first one about taking uh, or really creating the opportunities, uh, I think that comes from the idea that probably all of you, um, those who I know, I can say this for sure, those I don't know, I, I'm, I'm sure it's probably true, is we have a lot of bright people here who have a lot of fantastic things and uh, that they're interested in. Also, every person is a unique combination of interests and skills and abilities and circumstances. So it's it stands to reason then, to me at least, that if you want to do something, um, it's probably, if you want to do something you really think it's special, it, it may be the case that nobody's done it before and or nobody's thought that way to do it. And so there's a lot of onus on oneself to try to create opportunities, even if that opportunity is really not presented to you. Um, I've seen that in my personal career where I have asked other of my colleagues, imagine me, I was a, the, one of the first times I learned this lesson, again, I probably was working at the lab a year as a technician, I'm nobody, right? You could still say I'm nobody. Um, but I was um, judging science fair competitions because I had a great high school science experience and I thought, well, uh, I'd love to do that as a way to give back. So I went and judged science competitions and I realized that a lot of students had no idea what they were doing in terms of presenting their work. And I thought, well, that's not fair because students get to go into the lab to sort of uh, play around with stuff and have fun and learn but they never actually see the science communication part of science and actually they've never been to a poster session. So I suggested to the meetings and courses folks, like why don't we invite them to the meetings and why don't we develop a program so they could see that part? And then everybody said yes. And I was like, why are they listening to me? <laughs> That's stupid. Uh, but yet we had a program and we created, created all of this great stuff. And same thing later, um, I had a student, I was filling in for a class and, um, she, it turned out that her mother uh, had cancer and her father wrote me a letter. So she came up to me a second day of class and her father wrote a letter saying, I'm an engineer. Um, my wife has cancer and my daughter's enjoying your class and I don't understand anything people are telling me. Um, can you help me? Uh, so since I was happening to be the closest he knew to uh, somebody who knew something about medicine. So I literally just went to my colleagues. I went up to uh, uh, James Watson, for better or worse, uh, and said, hey, come meet these people. And I went to another co colleague, a cancer biologist, come, let's have a lunch. And everybody listened. And so I just thought it was interesting that despite the fact that oftentimes many of us, myself included, might suffer from imposter syndrome, people will actually listen to good ideas. And so whatever your idea is, it may not always uh, strike gold the first time you try to implement it, but just not you know, having the audacity, what do you have to lose? If you have an idea that you really believe in and 20 of them won't work out, but that 21st one might, I'll really be sure to go for it is, is really uh, something that I found 
uh, taking that opportunity uh, it, 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 and creating that opportunity when it's not given to you is really important. As for taking the opportunity, uh, what I mean by that is oftentimes there will be opportunities that don't seem to be of a lot of value or don't seem connected to your career or don't seem to you know, get you to the next step. Now, there are times when everybody's in survival mode and you do have to focus on what's the next step. Like I actually need to work or as Beth was talking about, so that's lots of the different uh, challenges we might face. And um, what I have benefited from a lot, and this is not always the case for, for every person, nor will it always be the case for me, but I benefited from the case of being able to say yes to things. Um, you don't want to overdo it. I'll talk about that next, about understanding people. But saying yes to things, even if it wasn't clear, how does this benefit me or how does it uh, get me to the next step? And often the benefit actually came up from meeting interesting people and finding different ways that they could contribute to something that I was doing or that I can contribute to something they were doing and forming collaborations and maybe even um, friendships that were tremendously more valuable than what the the you know writing on the paper might have said about whether this experience was worth it or not. Um, so taking opportunities to especially to help somebody if they have a passion, they're taking their they're creating their opportunity and you can add to it like I'm doing today, right? I get to meet all of you. Uh, this is a fantastic idea by Malvika and by Yo and Berenice and others. Uh, but you know I don't have I have other things to do today. But yet I get to be here, and yet I don't know what will be the next amazing thing that comes out of this. So always taking the opportunity when somebody gives you a chance to help them, and that leads to the final point, which is understanding people. Um, I consider myself an introvert. I'm not. You know I'm actually like completely not experiencing any anxiety from the current situation. I'm like, this is fine for me <laughs> in some ways, other than the bad stuff that's happening. And yes, it could happen to me too. And that's another story. You, you get enough of that. But um, even if you don't consider yourself an extrovert, and this goes a lot to what, uh, what Beth said, uh, you have to understand people. So I don't even care. And this also goes to what Fotos was talking about. If you're in a lab and you only have two people that you need to understand, then you need to understand them. What are, where are they coming from? What do they need? Uh, that really means cultivating empathy for other people. And once you understand people, you, you, problems like micromanagement can, can go away. If you also combine that understanding with the ability to trust. Um, so the very first thing may be understanding yourself and really getting to know who you are. And then hopefully, and a lot of times when I see people that are, quote, maybe difficult to understand, it's often because they don't understand themselves, I think. Uh, and fortunately, maybe they're going through something that I've gone through and that I've worked through, and so I'm a better opportunity to understand where they're coming from and why this might be the right time to say something or might not. Um, but once you understand people and once you take that opportunity, then you realize it's more important than your science, it's more important than anything else, because at the end of the day, from my observation in my last sentence, because I'm already over my eight minutes, is that the difference between excellent scientists um, is not for, you know, it's not their science, I think. Uh, yes, everybody can have an amazing discovery that totally blows things out of the water, but it's those scientists who are able to communicate effectively, which is a people skill, and that are able to network effectively that I see is always a differentiator, and, and that just makes it. I've seen wonderful, fantastic, bright, brilliant scientists who either aren't surrounded by those people or aren't naturally them, that themselves. And so the ability to sell yourself and communicate and do those things that are so-called self-skills is a differentiator and you have to do that. So um, that's my spiel, happy. Uh, I don't know if that generates questions, but it's just sort of observations that I hope uh, maybe we'll turn into future conversations with all of you. That was wonderful, Jason. Uh, thanks, Beth. Um, so we have questions. Uh, we have someone writing in. It's supposed, in. To, not a, it's supposed to not generate questions, okay. <laughs> Um, do you want to verbalize because I see you're still writing? I see some notes coming or people are taking, uh, or there were some notes taking, coming. Malvika is a machine for notes. <laughs> oh, okay. 
but if there are questions yeah and so then we have one question which says what do you do when you run out of steam or reach a stage of exhaustion with creating your opportunity, starting contributing to project, networking, and connecting with the right people. I take naps a lot. <laughs> so <laughs> well, that's one of my knowing myself, right? Uh, you know, even now, like especially making as somebody, I, I like the tweet that I saw this morning of you're not working from home, you're working, you're in a crisis trying to work from home. Uh, which is, you know, whether the difference between being something in choice or not. And I'm working from home, um, doing things. And after a Zoom call, uh, if it's, you know, whatever, you know, whatever I have to do, guess what? If it's time to take a nap, if it's time to do something else and go take a break, I'm taking it. Um, I find that and me personally, if I'm really interested in something, and if I really think that this is a great thing, um, then when you work on it, you can just sit there for hours and work on it. Uh, that's that's me. Um, and also there are a lot of things where I'm very reluctant to start it. I don't want to do the slides that I'm doing now. And then as soon as I do it, oh, wow, this is amazing. I'm going to get to explain this to them and let me find this analogy and let me do that. So I think you need to know your personality style um, and how you approach problems uh, so that you can do the appropriate self-care. But for me, I don't feel guilty about saying, you know, I'm going to take a nap every day if I need it. And some weeks, I'll, I'll want my nap and some weeks I won't um, and my chocolate milk and my cookie and whatever, you know, whatever it is that you need to get yourself uh, where you need to be. I think you should be un unapologetic about that's what you need and that's how you work. And, you know, as long as your work is getting where you need to go, then people should, should have to accept that. That's, that's me. Now other people above you may not accept that. And then you have a conflict. Okay, thank you so much, Jason. That was brilliant, even without a slide. Um, and Jason has also left uh, how to contact him. He's also founder of LifeSci Trainer. So anybody who are training in any capacity can join the Slack channel. It's quite great. Um, and now, because Jason has already talked about self-care a little bit, it's a good segue for me to give the floor to you. Amazing. Thanks, Malvika. And uh, thank you to our three brilliant speakers. Uh, Jason, I think I had a little tear in my eye at some points from the inspiring points you were making. So thank you so much. Um, so yeah, we're going to talk a little bit about, um, first of all, before the self-care, we have a breakout room. Um, so we have um, just some talk about career, basically. Uh, if you think about, we've talked about different career paths and leadership and things that you might be doing or things that you could think about doing. Um, and so we have three questions. And so we'll, we'll stick everyone in breakout rooms. You have 12 minutes. So it's about four, four minutes per person, given three, minute, three people in a breakout room. And the questions are, this time, what brought you to your work and to open leadership? So why are you here today? And I think we've reflected on this in the past, but it might be nice to think again now. Uh, and also, what would you need to keep doing this work for another five years? And what would you need to keep this work uh, for the rest of your career? So this is just really reflecting. If this is work that you like and that you want to be doing, what would need to be in place? Uh, so is that uh, okay and clear? Thumbs up if yes. I have a bunch of thumbs up. Amazing. Okay, I'm going to transport you to your rooms now. Remember, if you need help, then you, there is an ask for help button that will transport hosts into the room. And I'm sending you all off. I'm not sure if Christina's oh, I've got two Christines. Let me move her to the other one. Here we go. Renata, are you okay? Okay, well, if you come back, you'll be in a breakout room on your own. So let us know if you need any help. <laughs> oh, he has to leave in a few minutes, he said. Oh, yep, yeah, I see. That makes sense.
Thanks for joining, Renato. Check out for the self-care and ally skill recording later. <laughs> or just I'll, go I'll through. follow the rest of the recording afterwards. Don't worry. Have Lovely nice to have you here. All right. Cheers. Yeah. See you around. Bye. I'm recording anyway. I'm good. Right, we've resumed. So um, we're talking today about personal ecology and about self-care. And to go there, we need to define these terms, first of all. So personal ecology, we're talking about what we do to maintain balance, uh, basically making sure that over the long term that we're efficient, that we're happy um, and that we look after ourselves. And then to move on and to define self-care, this is what we do to take care of ourselves so that we can maintain our own personal ecology. Um, and also perhaps more importantly, so that we can continue to do stuff that's inspiring and that fulfills us. So we have a few different uh, reflections that we'd like you to look at just in terms of this. Um, as if, if I was to guess, um, then most of you all, um, as you're working on possibly a volunteer project right now, um, and especially when we are ba based at home and uh, many of us are, have, have a lot of things that we haven't been thinking about in the past, sometimes just reflecting on some things uh, that make you, um, what, what makes you go and maybe what is less fulfilling. Um, so this is more of um, a, an assignment to think about later on, uh, but try to think of some word pairs that describe a really fulfilling day at work. And um, so this might be positive interactions. It might be things that uh, you finished off or some ideas that you generated and just try and define those for yourself just in word pairs. Not, so not a single word, not really long sentences, just some really quick, um, succinct concepts. Um, and on the other side, try and um, weigh on some things that describe your unfulfilling, um, uh, unfulfilling days at work. So whether that might be negative interactions or where you're stuck, or maybe you just feel like you're in some sort of rut. And we actually have a worksheet that you can look at later on to follow up. And we were suggest I thought maybe yeah, we could follow up with these on Getter. Um, but I'll move on just to talking about identifying some of the things that uh, are involved with self-care. Um, so once you've sort of done the reflection where you've thought about, okay, what's a really good day and what's maybe a less good day, it gives you the chance to identify it and then you can actually try and promote the things that are working well for you and also if you're identifying the things that aren't working so well, then maybe you can try and avoid those. Um, so self-care at work for yourself and your team members is something that needs to be proactive. Uh, so it's not just like where you come along and you think, well, I'm exhausted, um, I need to take a break, but try and think about it in the longer term. If I do this, I might be exhausted. Um, you know, so I think Jason, when he was talking earlier and he was saying, I know myself, I know that if I do this and I need to take a nap, <laughs> I think that's a great example that we actually have of um, being proactive and understanding what he needs to look after himself in the longer term. Um, so if you ensure your own well-being, then you can, you can work on, other, on ensuring the well-being of others as well. So if you're maintaining communities, it's really important to make sure that you can demo and model that you're well and also that you're in a space where you can actually look after your communities and look after for the, those that you care for. And so that might be your family, it might be your team members, it might be contributors to your open project. Um, and once you're able to do that, then you can make space and you can enable others to do the same. Um, I, I think one example I have I, is uh, something Christine might uh, feel a lot as well. So uh, my team, we actually take on Google Summer of Code interns most years. And yesterday it was uh, the final deadline for people to submit their project proposals to come and code with us for three months. Um, and really often, I see people saying, I'm going to dedicate 10 hours a week, six days a week, of, and, and then we're gonna work on weekends as well. And we just sort of say, hey, gentle there, slow down. We want you to be happy. We want you to be able to work with us for three months. If you're gonna be working 60, 70 hour weeks, you're probably gonna burn out after week, week three. Um, so thinking about others and making sure that you're proactively encouraging the behaviors you want to see is really important. Um, so we have a few more toolkits of things, um, reflective exercises that we can suggest. Um, again, these are actually all in the handout that you can look at af after this talk. Um, but we have a work-life quadrants snapshot. So that's four questions. There's things at work that you want to keep at work. So they're fine for work, but that's enough once you're done. And there's things at work that you want to bring into your life. 
Um, so that would mean, uh, I'm trying to think of an example, some practice, some friendliness, some nice thing that you actually want to do at home as well. And then on the other side, there's setting some boundaries, like um, there's things in my life that I want to keep outside work. It's quite reasonable that you might want to not bring something into work. You might not want to talk about your family or something else that's going on. Uh, but there might be things in your life that you do want to bring into work. And just getting you know, some of those reflections and figuring out what the boundaries are that are correct for you in terms of your self-care is really good. Um, and then once you've done those, you can reflect on them a little bit. So what do your responses show about your work-life balance? So it might be that you are bringing things home that you don't want to, especially right now, bringing things home doesn't take a lot of work if you're actually stuck in your home all the time. <laughs> so I think it's really good to think about that and how you set boundaries. It might be that you don't check your laptop outside of your office hours and then you have to go into your office um, if you have an office um, to, um, to, to look at that laptop and otherwise it stays shut and you keep it away um, and look at the opportunities to change things and to set those boundaries um, and then you can also do a snapshot look at the things that distract you what makes you less happy what could you fix maybe it's tidying up the room that you're working in to make things happier maybe it is sorting out your desk your desktop your virtual desktop on your laptop um, and on the other side what brings you delight bring more of that in i think especially right now we we it's a good idea to give yourself a bit more leniency in terms of looking after yourself and others so share your share pictures of your cat don't be ashamed of it <laughs> it's going to be great you know think, think about the things that make you happy as well and actually spend a minute or two just to write those down uh, and then finally we have a compare and contrast exercise so what do you like about your work-life balance uh and what uh what would you like it to be like in the, in the future? So how would you like to change things? Um, I know I had an amazing insight and it's disappeared before I said it. I know it myself. It'll probably come back to me later, probably after I've stopped speaking. But anyway, <laughs> uh, so some closing thoughts and comments on this. Uh, is this. We were going to suggest if anyone has any ideas about self-care or reflection um, that you might like to think about, maybe share those on Getter. Um, and maybe just for now, even if you don't have time to look at the exercises, just think a single immediate next step that you could take just to make your personal ecology, um, your work-life balance a little bit better. And also who can help with that? Uh, maybe it's something that you have to ask someone else to reflect on or to talk about or to make a change with. So it might not be something that uh, you do on your own, but you work with others to do as well. And I think that's everything I have for the minute. Uh, so I'm going to stop sharing and go back to the document. So if you take a look on the cohort core notes, we have, um, I, I've just highlighted the prompts for these various exercises um, and it really is a nice thing to reflect to go down to write on them to look at them and then maybe come back in six months and see what's changed and what you can do about it um, but again if you don't have time to go through those now then just think about one single action that you might want to do and if you feel like it we're suggesting add questions here or comments if you wish to reflect upon anything um and we'll also try and see if we can discuss those and get her and maybe get a bit more get her conversation going on at the minute as well um but i think that's everything from me malvika i have not left you much time i'm really sorry <laughs> that's okay i would uh, continue with the ally skill so these topics are something we truly care about and it's a shame that we couldn't uh, allocate more time to discuss it and it's also an an optional call Therefore, what we want to do is uh, introduce this topic quickly and expect that you would bring these conversation in a global way on the Gitter for those folks who haven't been able to join us today. So I will share my screen. So Ally Skill is a huge workshop and they generally take about three to four hours and what we are trying to do is to basically introduce you to the topic so if whenever you have time three to four hours um, it would be really a useful way to spend your time on something that's going to be that's going to stick with you for a long time 
So ally skill is about using our societal advantages for good. What is an ally? And before that, I would like to speak of some terminology. First is privilege. It's an unearned advantage given by society to some people, but not all. And operations. Operation is systemic pervasive inequality that is present throughout the society. It benefits people with more privilege and harms those with fewer privilege. And then target. It's someone in your community or workplace who suffers from oppression, also called as a member of a marginalized group. An ally is someone who takes conscious action, a member of a social group that enjoys some societal privileges, working to understand their own privilege and step up for others. So here are a few things which are privileges for some people um, and not for others. So, these are non-exhaustive list, but, but don't take it for just one word. It, if you're white, it doesn't mean you have all the privileges. Um, or if you are a straight person, it doesn't mean you have all the privileges. But there are, there are always places where you will be privileged compared to someone else. And a life skill is about identifying those privileges and standing up for people who have uh, lesser advantages than you. The basic ally skills are be short, simple, and firm. Don't try to be funny in a situation which is not funny for someone else. Play for the audience, not to please someone. Simple responses are really important, and these are something that doesn't come when it should. Therefore, practice it beforehand. Write down for yourself what kind of simple responses you would like to receive when you're in an awkward situation. And pick your battles. Sometimes it's better not to pick them. So why should allies take action more than the target? Members of minority group, for example, a female leader who engage in diversity valuing behaviors are penalized with worse performance rating, whereas members of majority groups who engage in diversity valuing behaviors are not penalized for doing so. So this statement is from a, a study and the study was done to understand the behavior based on genders. And it was apparent that certain situations were more favorable for one gender compared to others. And even though there was no difference in, in the evaluation that they were conducting. So in short, allies have more power and influence and people do not blame them when they speak up compared to people who have less power and privileges. Allies are often in majority, uh, therefore they're also less prone to get attacked allies are not penalized for diversity value, valuing behavior. Nobody can say, oh, you're just whining or complaining because they are stepping up and speaking for others. Allies have more time and energy because one thing we need to realize that a lot of people who face disadvantages are already trying to combat those challenges and they have often less time and energy to deal with other sort of behavior that can add to their work. Allies can't be accused of jealousy and allies are often seen as altruistic, giving, and kind. So terminologies are important. Use the right words. Um, and we have provided a huge handout for you. Uh, again, it's a huge handout. Therefore, take your time whenever you have it. And with that, uh, I would invite you to bring these conversation on Gitter or in your network. Um, these are really difficult uh, topics to understand on your own. So the more people you share with, uh, the more understanding it will bring you. Okay, so we have three minutes. Probably we can still take a few questions on either self-care or ally skill. Yeah, so I, I was just wondering how can I feel find an ally because I feel that in the current situa situation I am actually a minority. I am a woman with a child and with a partner who has a, an, like a quite an intensive job so a lot of child care is on me and of course my work is impaired on the, with this and so on. And then I have a feeling that the view of the management is that people who um, 
well, people who don't have children are like doing their work normally, while um, parents in these special circumstances are the ones to blame and should kind of write off the hours that they can't work. And it feels a bit unfair while others are not even adjusting their again agendas to in, be like to accommodate a bit our special situation. But of course, if I would speak up now, I would be jealous and everything else. So how do I find an ally? <laughs> How do I make someone an ally for me? I, can I open this question for other members who actually have children? Because I might not be the right person to answer that. So I know Matush and Cassandra, do you face a similar situation? Do you have any tips for Lena? One thing that I found personally quite powerful for me, is talking to people who haven't got children and talking to them about their personal responses to this current crisis and actually the idea that the people without children are working normally it, i think is is not real in many cases so and and i've got some particular friends that have got like extra caring responsibilities for other people as well but in general I think that we're not that different. Our situation is not that different. And so I've been trying to promote the fact that everyone's productivity is down. And then I've just also got this additional reason why my productivity is down. So once we accept that we're all struggling, then also be aware that I also have a child running around half the time. Um, that said, our institution has been uh, quietly quite supportive in how they've they've worded it that they appreciate that we're not going to be able to work at our pro full productivity and um I think it's just I have to be honest and realistic with the world out there that there is no way that I'm going to be able to work at the same pace that I could and that's just it what are you going to do you know it's, uh, yeah, but I appreciate that that's, it's, it comes from a place where my job is secure. There was some threat of like, someone's going to take an inventory about what we've been doing when we come back to work, whenever that is. And all the people without children are going to have done so much more than we have. And, you know, that might be the case. And um, I'm prepared to fight for um, like a understanding the, of our situation but I think there's there is enough there are enough people talking about out there that it's a recognized problem thank you for sharing that because I I have to say that's really profound for me because I don't have caring responsibility and um, just to get an insight of how challenging it could be when people are not on the same page Please continue discussing this on the guitar because I think there are a lot of people who need to hear these. And we've reached to the end of the call. Uh, you and I have been exploring the idea of how we can allow you to have a lot of uh, opportunity to talk to each other. And we will come up with our plan sooner so you can discuss these exact topics with each other in your own, own time and own space. Um, there's no assignment this week extra except for if you are willing to please share all these uh, learning tips and experiences on guitar. Anything else to add you before we finish? Take care my friends. <laughs> yes please take care and have a lovely evening wherever you are. Thank you all. Bye. Take Thank care. you so much. Uh, this will Christine, thank you so much for being our host today. Oh my God, no problem. So much. The least I can do to put Canadian taxpayer resources at your disposal. <laughs> um, you guys do normally do a chat afterwards, or what? How can I help for next time or for cleanup here? So I think the recording is still going on. Oh, good reminder! Good reminder! I've stopped the recording.